The elders of the Pruitt and Lobit congregation welcome you to this series of lectures on the Apostles' Doctrine and Fellowship. It is our hope and prayer that the lessons these five men bring will be edifying and upbuilding to the flock over which the Lord has charged to our responsibility. As did Cornelius, we have encouraged the members of this congregation to invite friends and relatives from far and near to come and learn from this series of lessons from God's Word. As the morals of society around us have declined, it has had an effect on the Lord's Church. In many places, clear and pointed preaching has given way to soft teaching and preaching that neglects specific application to sins of the individual Christian. The result is an increasing moral looseness among God's people which has not been seen in past generations. It is our intent that the sermons presented will show the clear and unmistakable difference between the entirety of what the Bible says and the unbalanced practice of avoiding things of a negative nature. The men participating in this lectureship have been encouraged to make plain and pointed applications but avoid that which may be construed as personal attacks towards men or congregations. Please compare the things presented with what you read in the Bible so each one may benefit from this lectureship. And now speaking, Ron Halbrook, Divine Definitions of Fellowship and Factualism. What a high and holy privilege it is to be brought closer together as God's people and closer to the Lord Himself as we join our hearts in these songs, as we pray together, and as we study from the Word of God. I have such deep love and respect for this church because of the stand that you've taken through many years. I have even a very personal reason to love and appreciate this church because my in-laws have worshipped here. Brother and Sister Clifford Bell, my wife, grew up here under the teaching and training of this church. I have a godly wife partly because of the influence of your good work. And I love the Bells, I might add, not only as in-laws, but as some of the strongest, most faithful and loving Christians that I've ever known. And I don't say that just so I can keep eating the banana pudding and the other goodies we get at their house. In 2 Timothy 1 and verse 8, the Bible says, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, and we should never be ashamed of truth. But Paul adds something of a personal nature when he said, Nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Paul said, don't take the attitude that you're going to stand for truth, but you're going to stand apart from me and that you don't want your name associated with me because there will be a certain stigma attached to me and certain afflictions that might follow. I want you to know that not only I'm not ashamed of the truth, I'm not ashamed of this church and the stand it's taking. I'm not ashamed to be associated with that. I'm not ashamed of the truth and I'm not ashamed of these elders. They don't claim perfection and I'm not talking about any such thing as that any more than Paul claimed it. But as Paul said to Timothy not to be ashamed of Paul and the afflictions and false charges that he bore, I'm not ashamed of these elders and what they bear along that line and they've been bearing it. I'm not ashamed for my name to be associated with Jerry Fight and Harry Osborne, with Larry Hafley, and Tom Roberts and these other men who have been preaching the truth and that doesn't mean for a moment I regard them as perfect or infallible men any more than I would regard myself so. But I don't feel like there's some stink attached to their name that would attach to me if I said I love and respect and appreciate them for the stand they're taking. And I believe there are some brethren among us who are saying I want to stand for the truth as much as I can stand for it and as far away as I can stand for it away from some of these men. Each man just makes his own decision. 
But I'm telling you, I'm not ashamed of that. My subject is divine definitions of fellowship and factionalism. And we're really talking about fellowship with God and His people as it applies to the divorce and remarriage issue. I want to begin in 1 John 1, 1 through 3. And I forgot to give you that passage as the first chart. But notice, please, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. Fellowship, as God revealed it in the Bible, is a subject that we're going to be looking at again this morning. We know nothing more or less on any religious subject than what the Bible reveals. Now this text says that fellowship with God is based on fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ. And that that is based on fellowship with the apostles of Christ and that that is based upon hearing, believing, and obeying what the apostles preached. In short, true fellowship with God is based on abiding within the teaching of His Word. Now many other answers are proposed as to what constitutes the basis of fellowship, and some folks even are willing to accept the Bible answer in part if that may be compromised with some other answers. But the epistles of John emphasize this one solitary, courageous, uncompromising answer. That true fellowship with God is based on abiding within the teaching of His Word. Now all the other answers and compromises are destined to die. They come and go. But the psalmist said, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Psalm 119, verse 89. Some poet has well said, Truth never dies. The ages come and go. The mountains wear away, the stars retire. Destruction lays earth's mighty cities low. And empires, states, and dynasties expire. But caught and handed onward by the wise, truth never dies. And we're here to study and to teach God's Word that it may be handed onward and onward to the next generation and the next in the confidence that truth never dies. One reason this lesson is needed today is because we're being asked to compromise the standard of truth on fellowship as it relates to flagrant false doctrine on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. The epistles of John can ground us in the truth on fellowship as defined by God and thus help us to meet and to defeat the challenge of error. John wrote to refute in principle the same false theories that we face today. And so let's look at how John contrasts true fellowship with God with the false theories of men. John emphasizes the concept of fellowship with God in terms of light, love, and life. God is light, God is love, God is life. And we abide in God in that light, that love, that life when we maintain fidelity to the Word of God. That's what John teaches. And we're going to see that now for the next several moments and minutes by simply reading the text of 1 John. Will you then have your Bible open and we'll also have the passages on the overhead as we begin in 1 John 1. Now we notice that in verse 3, he said, That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you. Notice the emphasis on that which is declared. We have fellowship on the basis of that which the apostles declared. Now in verse 4, And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. There is no greater joy that can ever be had than the joy 
of hearing, believing, obeying, and practicing the things that are taught in the Word of God. I hope you mark that verse in particular. There's no greater joy than singing these songs as we've been led in them. Brother, G Brother Stevens has effectively selected songs that relate to our lessons, songs that bind our hearts together in love, songs that point our minds toward the Lord. Is there a greater joy than this? Is there a greater joy than the tender prayers that have been led in this assembly, particularly last night as we prayed, even for those that have drifted into error? Is there any greater joy than serving the Lord? Now I'm emphasizing that for this reason, that virtually every era, including some we're studying right now, offer the promise of a greater joy and a deeper spirituality and a closer and truer fellowship with God than can be had by those cold, strict, legalistic preachers that are always talking about book, chapter, and verse, book, chapter, and verse, book, chapter, and verse. We're tired of emphasis on principles and propositions of the truth of the gospel and we're looking for some kind of experience-oriented religion as though there we will find the true joy. Oh, dear friend, there is no greater joy for people who love the Lord than reveling in His Word, studying it, reflecting on it, meditating on it, absorbing it into our very lives. That's fellowship with God and it's based on what? is written. Verse 5 says this then is the message. You just start marking the expressions and noticing them. Virtually every verse says that this fellowship is based on what we declare and what we preach and what we write and the message. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Now after saying God is light then Remember that the darkness here represents sin and error. Then in verse 6, if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness in sin and error, we lie and do not the truth. The truth. We're right back to the message of revelation, aren't we? And verse 7, if we walk in the light as he is in the light. What is the light? The light is the truth. The truth is the light, my friend. That's what he's talking about. Then we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanseth us from all sin. Yes, we may stumble in air along the way, but the blood of Christ is available to those who continue to look to the light of truth and who correct their course in keeping with the line of truth. Notice further in the next verse, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And so the imperative thing is that we abide in the truth and the truth be in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we've not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. We have that which is declared, we have the message, we have the light, we have the truth, we have his word. Do you see it? Over and over that John is teaching that true fellowship with God is based on what? abiding in the word of truth. And then also we notice in chapter 2 verse 1, my little children, these things write I unto you, warning us not to sin, but that if we do, we have an advocate. And then in verse 3, hereby we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Why that old cold legalistic John. Doesn't he know that what we want is a person and not a principle? We want Christ and not commandments. Do you see the difference of emphasis in apostolic teaching and what we're being fed today and what some are enamored with even among our own brethren? I tell you it's a very different emphasis. Verse 4, he that saith, I know him, there's the concept of fellowship, knowing him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Cold, legalistic John, why didn't he say, he that saith, I know him, and keepeth not Christ? Why doesn't he emphasize Christ? Why must it be commandments, commandments? Are you beginning to see through the sophistry? that we're being fed? 
But whoso keepeth his word, why not whoso keepeth Christ? John, are you just a pure legalist? And John even said there was joy in all of this. In him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby we know that we are in him. Verse 6, He that saith he abideth in him ought also himself to walk even as he walked. Well, how did Christ walk? Well, he walked according to the truth and that's the very thing John is talking about. Now he says in verse 7 that he's writing no new commandment. It's what he's writing, you see. But the old commandment which you had from the beginning, he's writing and teaching them things that have been taught before. The old commandment is the word which you have heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write unto you. Right, commandment, right, commandment. Which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. He that saith he is in the light, hateth his brother, is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. Now he introduces this matter of hating certain brethren in the context where he talks about fellowship based on abiding in the Word of God. Do you know why the subject of hatred is introduced at that point? Is it because John is so hateful that he just keeps insisting on word and commandments? The hate's coming from the other direction. The hate is provoked by this teaching. The hate and the resentment and the holding of noses is provoked by this teaching and by this warfare that John is conducting. That's why he says, despite and hatred is stirred in some. And he says, what he's saying is, in spite of their sweet possum smiles and their smooth words, friend, you had better get your focus on the Word, the truth, because that's where the real fellowship with God is. That's what he's teaching us. Notice in verses 12 to 14 that six times he says, I write to those of different levels of maturity encouraging them to stay the course. I write to you, I write to you, I write to you because fellowship is based on what is written. Notice also in verse 15 and 16, we are warned not to love the world and the things of the world. Worldly impulses and worldly desires must be laid aside. And my friend, truth thrives on worldly impulses and worldly desires. But in verse 17, he that doeth the will of God, back to divine revelation, abideth forever. Notice that he says, in verse 18, little children, it is the last time. And as you have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby you know that it is the last time. Now things that had first been spoken are now being written. He says, I told you about it and I'm writing you about it. Fellowship is based on abiding in what is written. Verse 19, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they no doubt would have continued with us. What is he talking about, this us? Is he talking about John is trying to create his own party and sect in the church by lining everybody up with him in a personal way? The us has to do with the truth that he's been emphasizing. What we declare, what we write, the commandment of the Lord, the light, and all of that. There are those who won't abide in that. And this is the sense in which they depart from us, you see. They are not of us means they are not of this teaching. And in verse 21, I have not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. So he did not write to inform them of the truth, but to confirm them in the truth. John was just stuck on this preaching of the message, the word, the propositions, the principles of truth. He thought that's where the focus and the locus of fellowship was. Fellowship with God and with his people. See that? And then he continues, Who is a liar, verse 22, but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Thus you have the emphasis upon both the humanity and the deity of Christ, that he was fully God, fully man, 100% God, 100% man, as it is expressed sometimes. And John is saying that when men turn aside from that truth in either direction, they make themselves liars. Notice then he deals with a principle and a proposition of truth. That's what he sets before them. 
And he says, when you deny that, you have not the Father. Now look at verse 24. Let that therefore abide in you, which you have heard from the beginning. If that which you have heard from the beginning remain in you, what is that which they had heard? Divine revelation. If that continues in you, and you continue in that, you shall continue in the Son and in the Father. Does that strike you as powerful as it strikes me? How do you continue in the Son, loving Him, drawing near to Him, exalting Him, glorifying Him? It is by plowing deeper and deeper and deeper into the Word, holding closer and closer and closer to the Word. That's where the focus is. Verse 25, this is the promise that He hath promised us, even eternal life. And so this fellowship with God and His people continues through time and into eternity, doesn't it? In verse 26, these things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. The inspired word is filled with warnings against doctrinal and moral departures from the truth. And then in verse 29, if we know that he is righteous, we know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. And so righteousness again gets back to what is taught in the word of God and adhering to that. Now if you go through John doing what we've just done in the last few minutes, you'll find that same emphasis throughout 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. In chapter 4, verses 1 to 6, for instance, notice 1st uh, John 4 and 1. Beloved, to believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Try the spirits, all of them. Those who teach are the spirits, try them. This is generic as to the means and method of testing. It might be done through one or more questions. And he gives a test question in the next two verses. It might be done in a public debate. It might be done in a Bible class discussion. It might be done publicly or privately. But however it is done, uh, it must be done. He is specific as to the standard of truth, but not as to the means of testing for truth. And this congregation has taken its licks because it's used some means of testing for truth that some didn't like. And whether they like it or not, the testing shall be done. Verse 2 and 3 give test questions that might be used. Here is what the Holy Spirit revealed, serving as a, twist, a test question or issue. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. That's a proposition. That's a principle of truth. You know, a man could claim loyalty to Christ and say, I don't believe in these dry legalistic propositions. I want to draw nearer to the Lord. I want to exalt the Lord. I'm not interested in this cold legalistic proposition business. John said, here's the proposition, and if a man won't embrace it with all his heart, he doesn't belong to the Lord. Every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh he is not of God. He said in verse 4, Ye are of God, little children, have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Now notice, he that is in you, and somebody says, Preacher, that's it. That's what we ought to be preaching, Christ in us, instead of all this business about propositions and principles of truth. Well, in 2.24 we read a moment ago, Let that therefore abide in you which you heard from the beginning. And then he said, if that abides in you, you continue in the Son and Him in you. And that's what 4.4 4 is talking about. How is He in you? It's when you let the truth which was from the beginning abide in you. How is the devil in the world? And John especially speaking of the world in the sense of his opponents doctrinally here. How is the devil in them? By the error that they teach. Do you see it? In verse 6, we are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Knowing the spirit of truth and error is not based on an emotional experience. It's not based on your best grin. It's not based on smooth words and fair speeches, but adhering to apostolic teaching. Now my friend, that's true, real, warm, close, deep fellowship with God as John taught it. And I don't know any more about it than what the inspired writers taught about it. In 2 John verses 9 to 11, you have this very same emphasis. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God, abiding in the doctrine of Christ. See that? He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. And so there is the first aspect, fellowship with God. 
But then also, if there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, he's going to address fellowship among brethren. Receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed, for he that biddeth him God speed is partaker of his evil deed. John is teaching that true fellowship with God and his people is based upon what? The inspired revelation. Now, Let's move on and talk about applying these principles to the divorce and remarriage issue. The doctrine of Christ, the apostles' teaching, must be the standard of truth in all things. Is that not right? And we can see that from what John taught. Now in this regard, divorce and remarriage, I want to look at Matthew 19.9 for just a moment. Because we're thinking about the divorce and remarriage issue then what is the doctrine of Christ? Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. God's law is one man for one woman for a lifetime, with one and only one exception. When fornication occurs in that marriage, the innocent party can put away the guilty party and marry another without committing adultery. And without dissecting every detail, that's the principle, that's the fundamental law, and I think this audience would recognize it. But we face the problem of flagrant error being taught on these matters. I'm not judging anyone's intentions or motives at this point. I'm simply suggesting to you the consequences of false doctrine. The consequence is that when we begin tolerating and accepting and compromising with these theories, you spin the theory wheel of error and win an unscriptural mate every time. I don't care where you start, that's where it all comes out. Bob Malier, Jack Freeman, Lowell Williams and others emphasize that if the fornicator uh, takes a new mate, that that will be accepted by the Lord. Uh, James Bales in his book, Not Under Bondage, and then Jerry Bassett in his book, uh, rethinking Marriage, Divorce, and Remarriage, which he wrote with the help of his brother Don. Don helped on every page, the introduction says. Well, at any rate, they especially emphasize if the unbeliever leaves you, you can take another mate. E.C. Fuquay and Homer Haley in his book, um, what was his book? <laughs> Just left me. <laughs> brother Haley's book has to do with the kingdom theory. The Divorced and Remarried Who Would Come to God. That's right, that's the title of the book. But the approach being taken is that the law that we just read in Matthew 19 does not apply to people out in the world. They're not in the kingdom. And so we may baptize them into Christ, into the kingdom. Then and only then they come under that law. Roy Hall, J.L. Dabney and others teach that baptism uh, sanctifies the latest marriage. Olin Hicks and others are redefining adultery as non-sexual covenant breaking. All of these writers use elements of all these theories when you read their writings and they all reinforce one another because they all converge at the same point. You can spin this theory wheel of error and win an unscriptural mate every time. And so we're facing flagrant error on divorce and remarriage in our time. But now I want us to notice next, we're facing calls for compromise. Some are advocating explicitly or implicitly doctrinal unity in diversity. And by the way, some are telling us, well, the only kind of unity there is is unity in diversity. Yes, if you're talking about Romans 12. Yes, if you're talking about 1 Corinthians 12. Diversity is of gifts. But surely anyone would recognize in this context we're talking about unity in doctrinal diversity. And so we need to keep the understanding of context. But... In Christianity Magazine, there were a series of 17 articles on unity from November of 1988 to May of 1990 uh, by Brother Ed Harrell. And I want to notice just briefly that uh, he taught that Romans 14 will allow us to uh, tolerate the era of Brother Homer Haley. Brother Haley teaches that you can be baptized and stay married contrary to Matthew 19, 9 because it doesn't apply to you in that case. I want to be very... Fair to Brother Harold in making sure you understand he does not believe Brother Haley's view of that, but he believes that Romans 14 will allow us to accommodate men who so teach. That was in the November 1988 Christianity magazine. In the April 1989 issue, he said Romans 14 allows us to differ in matters of faith. In May of 89, that it allows differences of considerable moral and doctrinal import. And in May of 90, that the passage allows us to tolerate contradictory teachings and practices on important moral and doctrinal questions. 
Now, what sin could not be included in that category of important moral and doctrinal questions? Can you think of a single sin or false doctrine or practice uh, of apostasy that could not be included in such an expression as that? Brother Harold would not want all such sins and practices to be included. Again, I want to be fair to him. He would not want them all included. But I'm suggesting he lays down a principle that will make it very difficult for him to begin excluding any such practices. Now, there was no response, no rebuke, no review of that teaching after 17 articles. We're not talking about one article. We're not talking about a slip of the pen. We're not talking about we mostly believe the same thing, but sometimes we don't say it all the same way. We're talking about 17 articles, and none of the other editors of that paper have responded, rebuked, reviewed this teaching. Brother D. Bowman is in general agreement with it and will tell you that he is. Brother Sewell Hall has not responded. Brother Brent Lewis has not responded. Brother Paul Earnhardt, five years later, wrote some articles on Romans 14 that had some good things in them. But he did not tackle the teaching of Brother Harold or review it, uh, nor the general approach to fellowship which Brother Harold taught. Now I'm pleased that these brethren would allow open discussion of these passages and principles on unity have been publicly rejected because of the positive philosophy behind the paper. When I wrote all of the editors a courteous letter asking them that the other side might be heard in the paper, that this specifically might be addressed. And by the way, I said the writer does not need to be me. I suggested you might pick the writers. There are any number of good writers who maybe have not been directly involved in this controversy at times. Uh, they might select someone like uh, Osby Weaver or W.R. Jones. Are there any number of good men that I think would have handled it in the finest spirit? But I just suggested, please let the other side be heard. In the September 1990 issue, my plea was published with this response, quote, Christianity Magazine is not intended for the type discussion Brother Halbrook suggests. And so in other words, what we can have is a debate that's a monologue, a filibuster, but we can't have the other side. The inevitable result of the positive philosophy is compromise with sin and error. That's not a judgment of anyone's intentions. I don't believe any of the men have that as an intention but it is the necessary result of the philosophy they have embraced through the medium of that paper. Continued pleas and discussion are continued pleas that these matters be discussed and continued discussions of these matters uh, such as the material that uh, Brother Hayfley and others have published, my booklet on trends pointing toward a new apostasy and so on. These pleas have been rebuked in the form of a letter sent out in the fall of 1992 on the letterhead of Christianity Magazine that came in my mail saying that Christianity Magazine has been attacked in a way that is reckless and responsible. Paper is only upholding truth and opposing error. Do not be misled by extremists who have their own cause to promote. We do not intend to line up followers or create a party. We decry the transparent efforts of others to do precisely that without mentioning a single passage, without addressing a single issue that we've been literally pleading that these matters be addressed, those that have made the plea are now said to be reckless and irresponsible, to be extremists that are trying to line up followers and create a party. That goes through my heart like a knife, not because of any personal involvement on my part, but to think we could have reached the point among brethren that you have that mentality, that attitude, that response growing in the minds of some when the plea is made for open and honest and careful study of principles, pressing principles of truth. There's been no apology or retraction for the wording of that letter. It was slightly revised and later published in their paper, taking some of the sharper expressions out, but not changing any of the sentiments, and no retraction of these charges has ever been made. Which tells me that's the thinking of some of my brethren, brethren I know and love, that have that response to the pleas that are being made for open study. That alone tells me that we're entering into a time of grave danger. But as we think about calls for compromise, 
Sam Dawson has written uh, several things doing that. He has a book, Fellowship with God and His People, that was published in 1988, and a booklet taking, taken mostly from that book, When Brethren Differ, published in 1990. And these materials teach that uh, we need a change of attitude in how we approach marriage, divorce, and remarriage, and that passages like 2 John 9 to 11 ought not to be strictly applied uh, to departures from the truth on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And then also he published a booklet, Fellowship on Marriage, Divorce, and Remarriage in 1992 that was mailed out to virtually all the conservative congregations in the country in which he charges that a handful of younger preachers are about to split the church. If I remember right, he quoted one passage in the whole booklet. He did not take up a biblical discussion of these principles and passages, but he made charges similar to those that we saw uh, on the letter that was mailed out by Christianity Magazine. And, and I want to mention regarding that letter that since I quoted only an excerpt of it, the entire letter is on the table here so that you could have a copy and look at it. I don't want to leave in any way the impression that we're misrepresenting someone or taking something out of context. So you feel free to read the entire report sent out by Christianity Magazine. But that report, you see, made charges of extremism and so on. And so it was done in this booklet by Sam Dawson. I want you to see there's a pattern developing. There were certain patterns developing in the 50s. You could recognize them. There are certain patterns developing now. Lay aside our personal feelings for some of these men. And I have very deep personal feelings for many of these men. I mean feelings of love and tenderness. But we must be objective at this point as to truth and error. I want you to see that patterns are developing even among men that we have the warmest and tenderest feelings for. Their reactions to the pressing of certain principles and passages that need to be addressed, need to be studied and openly discussed. The charge was made. You talk about wild, irresponsible charges that uh, the brethren in Berlin, New Mexico and Others that were helping them there are trying to start a division that would uh, divide the entire brotherhood and all such statements as that. Men like Tim Stevens, who loves the truth, and men who are in the humblest way trying to help those who are in sin are being painted and tarred and feathered. And then we're told that Larry Hafley is the mean one, and if he didn't take so much joy in opposing error, we wouldn't have a problem. Harry Osborne is the mean one, violating congregational autonomy. Tim Stevens and others, they're the mean ones because they sounded an alarm that destructive teaching is being done. Brethren, can you see the pattern to all of this? Or am I just another one of the mean ones? One of the mad dogs? One of the rabid dogs? Is that all we can get out of this? But the pattern goes and flows and is spreading. Don Patton used Romans 14, quote, regarding marriage, divorce, and remarriage. I don't have to divide over that. In his sermon, April 12, 1990, the philosophy, the concept is growing. I know Don, I've loved him for years. It's not a personal issue be between anyone, and I don't want to keep repeating that statement. You can understand that we're trying to objectively consider principles of truth. Brother Bob Owen, whom I've known for many years, loved for many years, I've sat in his classes, um, and he said uh, in a sermon, September the 2nd, 1993, I'm talking tonight about fellowship in the context of a series of discussions on the marriage question. As he went through that discussion then, he appealed to Romans 14. He said there are at least 15 different positions on divorce and remarriage. And he said some teach any person who has divorced under any circumstance can remarry. Now again, to be fair to Brother Owen and so that you don't misunderstand, he would not endorse that teaching. But his point is that Romans 14, in the context of a series of discussions on the marriage question, would allow us to have fellowship with those who do teach and practice such things. And you see, it's not just somebody off out in the woods somewhere that's teaching this. And we're not making this up. And it, it's not that Tom Roberts ate too much pizza one night and had a bad dream and got up in a bad mood and preached a, a mean sermon. 
That's not what's happening. Men of real stature, I don't say that sarcastically, I say that sincerely. Men of stature and learning among us are embracing this. Well, Brother Halber, it's just a matter of private study. No, I'm documenting that it's a matter of public record and public teaching. And that's not the first time Brother Owen has taught that publicly. And uh, Brother Patton did not teach that only one time in his life. And Brother Harold did not teach that in one article where he slipped on a few words. Do you see the pattern that's spreading? And then Brother Earl Kimbrough, there's not a man that I love more or have a tenderer feeling for. And he's been a blessing to me through his writing and in other ways. In 1993, he published a booklet, How Shall We Treat Brethren With Whom We Disagree. He castigates self-appointed protectors of the faith who forget we may differ on dozens of issues involving both doctrinal and moral questions without any breach of fellowship, including the remarriage of the divorced persons. Now here again, I know we have to be careful that our emotions don't sweep us away. And I don't want to be overly sensitive about defending my friends. Tom is my friend. Uh, Harry is my friend. Jerry is my friend. Is that why... I, is that why I'm touched when some are saying how hard they are and they're lining up a party and all of that? No. Look at this. When men are pouring out their hearts in trying to teach truth, the response is, you fellas are a bunch of self-appointed protectors of the faith. What have they done? Taught their convictions in a conscientious way. I don't want to be unkind to Brother Kimbrough. Would it be unkind if I asked, when he expressed his convictions on this, was Brother Kimbrough making himself a self-appointed protector of the faith? Was he? Why is it that when we preach our convictions, we're self-appointed protectors of the faith, but when he preaches his, he's not? You say, Brother Halbrook, that hurts. It hurts me to even say it. But why that difference? I don't charge him with being that. In spite of the statements he's made, I think he's trying to set forth his convictions. I differ very pointedly with those convictions. But I'm not going to charge him with that. I'm not going to say why that irresponsible extremist, don't listen to him, he's just trying to create his own party. You know, I could talk like that for 30 minutes and never mention a Bible passage and never teach you a Bible principle, but I could close your mind where you'd never hear anything else he said. Brethren, do you see the pattern? Not only issues, but attitudes that are working among us. Now then, I want us to think in the last few minutes of our time about how division comes. I want us to be reminded that the Bible ground is always the unity ground. In John 17, 17 to 21, Jesus prayed that very beautiful prayer, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. He prayed that on the basis of truth they may all be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. And brethren, for 200 years we've been preaching that the Bible ground is the unity ground, and I believe that it is the unity ground today. The epistles of John teach the same thing. Departure from the Bible ground results in division, separation from God and His people. But now how do we recognize that division is inevitable and unavoidable? I want to talk for a few moments about that. First of all, we may recognize it when theories are being advocated and advanced that directly contradict the fundamental rule, baselines, or perimeters given by Jesus. Such as on Matthew 19 and verse 9. We've already looked at that. We've already seen that. But some other rule is being substituted for the one given by Jesus. It is not that brethren share the common playing field of truth given in such passages as Matthew 19:9 and they differ only as to whether a given situation constitutes an infraction of the rules recognized by all. No, what's happening is a new playing field is being drawn. Remember that chart, spin the theory wheel? 
totally new playing fields are being created by these theories. For instance, when Brother Haley says that the passage, Matthew 19, 9, does not even apply to those in the world, do you see we're not just discussing how to apply the passage in a given case. I can understand our having some give and take on a matter like that. We're talking about whether this fundamental rule or law even applies to people in any way. Do you see that? Whether it applies to certain people at all in any way. I'm just saying to you, even if I were to plead for compromise, uh, that might happen for some period of time, but for people who recognize this fundamental law that Jesus gave, uh, division is inevitable when theories are taught contradicting that fundamental law. I couldn't stop it. You can't. Secondly, when brethren defending these false theories almost invariably appeal to the premise that divine silence permits people to remain in marriages contrary to what Jesus stated, I want to tell you that division is inevitable. When you appeal to silence and the absence of a specific prohibition rather than to positive divine authority, brethren, give that seed that leaven enough time and division is inevitable. Whether Larry Hafley can grin pretty or not, division is inevitable when this comes in. Am I right? 1 Peter 4.11, If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. We must speak where the Bible speaks. We must be silent where the Bible is silent. We must give positive divine authority for our faith and practice. But the appeal to silence reflects and reinforces a departure from the fundamental precepts of Bible authority. Some are saying, where does the Bible say certain people cannot remain in their marriages? I will go to my grave with the shock. When I first saw the video of Brother Haley at Belen, New Mexico, I studied under him and his appeal was always going through the text, going through the text for three years. I sat at his feet. I wouldn't take anything for that experience. But, I will die with the shock of seeing him on that tape say, in essence, where does the Bible say these people have to get out of these marriages? Brethren, our appeal is to positive divine authority. We either can prove from the book people have the right to be in that marriage, or there's no authority for it. As we've learned from past apostasies, when one practice is justified by appealing to a perversion of divine silence, other practices are soon justified on the same basis, and listen to me, underscore it, that makes division inevitable. You can't stop it. This is coming if these appeals are not retracted. Brother Jack Freeman repeatedly made that argument in both of our debates. You'll find it in Don Bassett's book, uh, Jerry Bassett's book, which he wrote with the help of Don. But you'll find this, it's a pattern, it's growing, it's there. You're not going to stop it, and I'm not, except by teaching truth. But I'm saying if these men continue that, division is inevitable in spite of our best grin. Number three. Because these theories involve an open departure from the rule of morality given by Jesus and involve the appeal to silence, they breed looseness on other moral issues as well. And I'm saying to you, that when we teach and spread theories that breed that kind of looseness, division is inevitable. As time goes on, more and more people under the influence of these theories are participating in such worldly practices as immodest dress, in mixed swimming and in daily dress, gambling, dancing, drinking intoxicants. When I was preaching in California, I met people who had, not knowing any better, had been with their local preacher to his house and they, the preacher himself served drinks. That's in so-called conservative brethren. That's not coming down the road. That's already in the middle of the road in some places. Well, how did that get started, Brother Halbrook? You go back and think about places where that's being such openly uh, practiced are places where for many years you have this background of loose teaching on morality in regard to marriage. This carnality will increase, my dear brethren. 
And worldly-minded people and spiritually-minded people inevitably separate themselves from each other. You can't stop that. In 2 Timothy 2.16, he said that it will breed more ungodliness. In chapter 3 and verse 13, they will wax worse and worse. Now what happens eventually when that's uh, all in progress, 2 Corinthians 6.17, we have to come out and be separate. It'll reach that point. Ephesians 5.11, we can have no fellowship with it. But Brother Halbrook, some of you seem to be rejoicing that that's going to happen. My friend, you are reading hearts and you are reading wrong. That is gossip and evil surmising. These elders don't rejoice in what's happening to God's people today for crying out loud. What? How can we conduct Bible study? How can we appeal to truth when our brethren respond with a mentality like that? Well, you say Brother Hayfley is just too forceful at times. Is he any more forceful than the Apostle Paul who said of the circumcised party, he called them the mutilators and he said, let them mutilate themselves. Let them cut their private parts off is what he said. Larry's a softy compared to that. <laughs> Little old marshmallow sitting over there. <laughs> Somebody's rejoicing about all this? <laughs> Brethren, division is inevitable when people won't tolerate the persistent teaching of truth. Now division becomes inevitable. 90% of the fellowship question takes care of itself when the truth is consistently taught. Brother Foy E. Wallace Jr. taught me that in his writings. False teachers will not tolerate the preaching of the truth though they plead for toleration toward their teaching of error. And this is true of both those who teach the error and those who claim they want the truth but they want it on the basis of unity and diversity. And these people will say, we just want openness. So I say, good, let's have an open debate. And they say, you mean vicious dog? You're just glad that division is coming. Well, I thought you wanted open discussion. You shut up, you're troubling the church. Well, I thought we were going to have open Bible study. Brethren, just literally a few hours ago, I had a study with a brother on Romans 14 for about two and a half hours. You would know, many of you would know the name if I mentioned it. Not necessary in this case. But toward the end of our study, and neither one of us got out of sorts, but I said, so I called his name. I said, if I'm reading our exchange of views right, you really wouldn't remain in a congregation where I preach if I continued to preach the convictions that you and I have been discussing. Now remember, they're always telling us that Harry Osborne and Tom Roberts are causing a division. And I said, you wouldn't remain, would you? He paused a moment. Shook his head. No, he wouldn't remain. Now brethren, 90% of the fellowship issue takes care of itself when we persistently teach the truth. And if God has men of courage that are going to keep teaching the truth, then I'm telling you division is coming not because those men teach the truth, but because some won't tolerate that. They just won't. And our best possum grin won't hold them. Now, I need to address another thing and then we close. Are we doomed to divide on every difference of view? That's being brought up and I'm willing to address it. Brother Halbrook, if, if brethren generally have the outlook that you and others have, why we're going to split and splinter into a million pieces and we can never even have a local congregation. That's a fair issue. Suppose I just say you're reckless and irresponsible for raising that issue. Now folks, don't listen to that man because he's only trying to create a party because he raised that issue. Would that be a fair response? I don't think that it would. Let's put the issue on the table and think about it for a few moments. I want to point out first of all that we all recognize we have to distinguish apples and oranges. 
Philippians 1 and 10 says that we're to distinguish things that differ as one translation gives, so that we may approve the things that are excellent, as the King James says. It means you have to go through a sorting out process. Everything's not the same that appears to be the same on the surface. In chapter 4, verse 5, let your moderation be known to all men. Don't jump to rash conclusions. That would be one point that he's making there. Let's be careful and thoughtful when one, someone says, Brother Halbrook, I want to know if we're doomed to divide on every difference of view. That's a fair question. And my first response is that let's remember to distinguish apples and oranges. And I want to show how that we can do that. I want to suggest about 20 questions, just very briefly to you, that brethren who all recognize common principles of truth have differed on without any division, and really what we're thinking about here is fine-tuning some points of application. And I don't know that I've fine-tuned all of them. And I recognize that there need not be a division on them. Does a woman have the same right as a man to divorce her husband for a fornication? I've heard brethren discuss that. Can the marriage of an underaged couple be annulled? And if so, are they free to marry again? We hear that discussed. Number three, if a person who is free to marry marries someone who is not free, is the first person free to remarry after getting out of that marriage? Number four, would the answer depend on whether he entered the first marriage, knowing the other party was not free to marry? Number five, would it matter? Would the answer matter, or would the answer differ according to whether he'd been deceived or not when he entered that marriage? Or would the answer depend on how the person got out of this unauthorized marriage as to the technical grounds of how he did that? Number seven, you've heard this discussed. Can there ever be a separation? If so, on what grounds and for how long? Number eight, does 1 Corinthians 7, 5 cover every aspect of that question? Or do other Bible principles apply in some situations? Are there other principles that apply? Number nine, is a wife defrauding her husband in terms of 1 Corinthians 7, 15 if she does not submit to his drunken demands, his violence, and his perversion? I know of brethren discussing that. Number 10, must a wife remain with a husband who beats her and endangers her life and that of the children? Number 11, if she tries to put herself out of harm's way, what steps is she permitted to take, legal and otherwise? Then again, number 12, after divorcing for fornication, may the innocent and the guilty remarry each other? Number 13, does the answer to that question depend on whether the guilty had married into an adulterous situation first? Would that have a bearing on the answer? Number 14, when a man leaves his wife for no Bible reason over her protest to marry another, does his adultery, we all agree that it is adultery, but does his adultery give her the ground to appeal to God to dissolve her marriage bond? If so, can she marry again or does she remain bound to him in that matter? Number 16, when fornication is present, does it matter who initiates the legal proceedings if the innocent party is to have the right to remarry? 17, if the fornicator initiates the civil case, must the innocent party countersue in order to have the right to remarry? Brethren, discuss that from time to time. 18, if the innocent and the guilty parties have separate cases pending in courts of separate jurisdictions, will her right to remarry hinge upon which case was initiated first or which one is ruled upon first or other such legal details? I know of cases where that's being discussed. 19, if a man drives his wife out of the house by violent and abusive conduct and later commits adultery, may the wife, uh, in that case, uh, divorce him for fornication and marry again, or because she's already been out of the house, would that not be appropriate? Number 20, since he drove her out first, would her right to remarry depend on who got to the courthouse first uh, in the case that a divorce took place? Now you could add other things to this. Any number of other questions involving some complicated circumstances may arise where we might answer differently. And then you can introduce the common law uh, marriage and it has a whole set of its own naughty problems. And what I'm teaching, or rather is what I'm teaching, going to mean that we have to divide on all of these different points. And my answer to that is no. And I'm just going to use the four points I already gave you and turn each coin over and show you why the answer is no. Number one, here's why we won't divide in these matters. 
instead of repudiating and replacing the fundamental law or rule given by Jesus, all the parties to these 20 discussions and others make their appeal directly to the rule of one man for one woman for a lifetime, the only exception being that the innocent party can divorce the fornicator and marry another person. They all believe that. Now one or both parties to the discussion of some of these points may in some measure be inconsistent with the principle to which all appeal, but they share a equally a common commitment to a common principle. And I'm just telling you, there is always the opportunity for unity where you can make an appeal to a common principle. Division is not likely to occur when brethren share a common playing field of truth and differ only as to whether a given situation constitutes an infraction of the rules shared by all. If some inadvertent infraction occurs, it is not likely to spread and also in the case of some inadvertent infraction, eventual correction is likely, listen to me, because all parties continue to uphold the same standard. We keep testing ourselves by the same standard, we'll, fi we'll find where we're drifting and correct our course. Division is not inevitable in matters of this kind. Number two, none of the parties to such discussions argue that divine silence permits people to do anything. Everyone is appealing to positive divine authority, testing the arguments back and forth. Now I realize one or both parties might misunderstand the proper application of a text to a given situation. And I will even grant that sin might occur in some such case depending on the nature of the point involved. But in any case, even when sin occurs, brethren, there's a strong likelihood that the mistake eventually will be discovered. Why? Because of the constant emphasis on testing all things by the standard of positive authority. You keep that principle alive and we will see our mistakes. And in the meantime, no destructive repudiation of the basic premise of Bible authority is being introduced into the discussion. All parties agree that we must have positive, divine authority for what we preach in practice and that silence prohibits and their method of argumentation reflects their commitment to that premise. Number three, division is not inevitable because the observation of many years confirms that nothing in the arguments of brethren who differ on these matters is breeding looseness on other moral issues. Think about that. Brethren on either side of these questions are equally strong in warning about the dangers of immodest dress, gambling, dancing, drinking intoxicants, and such like. Are you beginning to see there's a difference between apples and oranges? There's a difference between the nature of these latter 20 questions I mentioned and uh, that spin the theory wheel chart, those theories? Brethren, these are not all in the same category of things. Do you see it? Number four, fellowship is rarely a problem in an atmosphere which encourages open study and the discussion of any issue in the light of God's Word. If we truly maintain that, brethren, we can sort out our problems. The forbearance that's been mentioned by, I think, every speaker, and I want to add my word to that, division should not be immediate and rash. It should be a last resort. Surely we reflect back to the 50s and 60s and realize that much forbearance helped to save many souls out of that apostasy. And we want that same forbearance today. But do you also realize that when in the context of that forbearance, instead of ignoring these issues, we're spending time discussing them. That doesn't have to mean every Sunday, every service, every class but it means we're willing to put the issues on the table and discuss them. Then I'm just telling you that division is never inevitable when you keep that atmosphere alive. It's just not. It just won't happen. Where there are open Bibles and open hearts, and wherever people sincerely search the Scriptures daily whether these things are so, when brethren truly believe that truth has nothing to fear from investigation, 
when both sides of controversial issues can be openly examined, we can and will maintain the unity of the Spirit in the beautiful bond of peace. I believe that with all of my heart. Sin and false doctrine simply do not thrive in that same atmosphere. Sin and false doctrine sooner or later are choked out by that very atmosphere or they're driven out by it. Like the brother when I asked him, would you stay under my preaching? No. He's one of the ones that would say, here we are today creating our own party. Now brethren, false teachers among us want toleration of their teaching and they want it without open study and discussion of issues. And that I will not grant. Each one may speak for himself. Brethren who have honest differences within the context of a common commitment to test all things by the truth, do not thwart the process of study and growth by demanding the right to teach certain things with without those things being put on the table for examination. Rather than to divide, brethren who maintain this commitment draw closer and closer in the process of study and growth. And I can speak of that from experience. Some of these men on this lecture program and myself have differed on some matters that we've continued to study and we've helped each other in that and we've sorted through things in that and are we dividing on every issue? No, sir. No, sir. It is the power of God's Word working in our lives when we keep this sincere commitment of open Bible study. It is the power of the Word of God to burn out the dross and to make us purer and better people and to draw us together. That will work, brethren. That will work. It is God's plan. We can maintain the unity mandated by God with all of my heart, I want us to do that. But we must recognize and expose apostate movements which depart from the faith and which divide the people of God. Do not be deceived by the ploy that it is our opposition to false doctrines and false teachers that will doom us to divide over every difference. And I want to leave you with this thought. We divide when we depart from the Bible ground of unity. I don't care who smiles and who doesn't smile. I don't care whose style of preaching you like and don't like. Brethren, you shake it all down. We divide when we depart from the Bible ground of unity. Notice please that division comes. Division comes when we promote any perversion of the gospel. You know, many of you know this chart from the days of the institutional division. Those that were pleading with truth were charged with causing that very division. Men in this audience like Harold Fike, W.R. Jones, Elmer Moore, and on and on I could go, that stood for truth and they were called everything in the book including extremists who are trying to line up their own party. Were you called that, brethren? Yes, you were. That's the tactic of error, isn't it? And you remember those days, but I want to ask you who was driving the wedge that divided the church? Was it W.R. Jones? Was it Harold Fite? Was it Elmer Moore? I deny that it was. And I'm not ashamed for my name to be associated with their name in the good fight for the faith which they maintained. Many of my opportunities to preach and teach today exist because of the work those men did. I'm glad they were not intimidated by the charge that they were causing a division. I'm glad they didn't lay their armor down. And I want, if it may be possible in the will of God, that my children will have a place to stand because I stood like W.R. Jones stood and that I stood like Harold Fight stood and that I stood like Elmer Moore stood. I may not have their capabilities, but I can do my two cents worth. And I intend to, God, so help me. Brethren, when these apostasies were introduced, the Missionary Society, Instrumental Music, Premillennialism, Church-Supported Benevolent Societies, the Herald of Truth, and the sponsoring churches, those that stood for truth were stigmatized by every ugly name that you can think about. But I'm asking you to think about who was causing the division in the meantime. 
those that kept hammering away, driving the wedge of human law, and those that compromised with it. Now today we have these new laws and theories on marriage and divorce, and I won't review all of those again, but I'm just asking you to realize that when men teach this, and they don't back up and they don't back off, then my friend, the issue must be put on the table. And when men teach these things, I'm not going to say they're trying to be self-appointed protectors of the faith and just don't listen to them. That's not the proper response. The proper response is put the issue on the table, open God's book, and examine it. When we do that, if we do it with an earnest and sincere heart, we'll see the error. We'll sort out our problems. And we'll be brought together in the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Do you believe that? I believe that. But when brethren want to teach this with immunity from review, and our paper is not designed for such a discussion as that, I want to tell you in spite of all the good intentions, yes, division will be inevitable. The division will be caused by closing the book and saying, I'm going to teach it. I don't care what the results are. You don't have any right to question it, and if you do, you're an irresponsible extremist. Now, brethren, you sow that seed, and we'll have division. You can decide for yourself who would be causing it. John teaches us that the basis of fellowship with God and His people is the inspired Word of God. If you don't remember anything else I've said today, Please remember that. Perhaps you disagree with some things I've said. And if that's your conviction by searching the Scripture, you stand on the book and help me to learn better. But let us remember, forever, O Lord, Thy Word is settled in heaven. Let us remember, truth never dies. The ages come and go, the mountains wear away, the stars retire. Destruction lays earth's mighty cities low, and empires, states, and dynasties expire. But caught and handed onward by the wise, truth never dies. God help me to pass that truth to my children, and that they will to another generation.